You either die a hero, or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. I can do those things, because I'm not a hero. I'm whatever Gotham needs me to be. They'll hunt you. You'll hunt me. You'll condemn me. Set the dogs on me. Because that's what needs to happen. Because sometimes, the truth isn't good enough. Sometimes, people deserve more. Sometimes, people deserve to have their faith rewarded. Alright. Here's one. And this is something I had been meaning to do. And eventually, uh, the G with the PhD, uh, Green Gorilla, will probably collab with me on this. And this is something interesting because I was actually um, was actually reviewing the uh, the Custody of Infants Act. And uh, this popped up in the notes. So sometimes it's okay to read the footnotes, right? Sometimes it's okay to read the footnotes. And sometimes you do. You, you learn stuff. And this actually popped up. This particular uh, review of uh, from, I think it's from the Columbia Law, uh, the Columbia Law uh, uh, School of Law, and uh, by Sarah Abramowitz. And uh, she's tracing back women's rights and, and mother mother's rights as a legacy before the, the Custody of Infants Act. And what she was saying is that before the Custody of Infants Act, uh, mothers really had uh, no claim, uh, no legal claim on their children, according to English law and most Western law. Mother had no claim. And this claim uh, first arose, even uh, Caroline Norton, who actually uh, proposed and actually pushed the custody of infant, infant sex, didn't believe in women's rights. She was, uh, a lot of feminists called her a proto-feminist. She didn't believe in feminism. She didn't believe in the rights of women per se. There's questions about what patriarchy actually is or what patriarchy actually was. Because what we think we have now is the patriarchy and it's really not. Not according to old English law. And this is something that um, that came across on my desk and I had to uh, beg, that came, I had to beg a couple of um, professors to actually dig this up for me. And I'm going to just start reading some of the highlighted portions. I don't want to, because I think the, this whole thing is like maybe uh, 40 pages long. So I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to read the highlighted portions that I think is interesting. And this will give you a taste of what uh, patriarchy was like prior to the custody of infants. Okay, this is a, a note. Uh, English Child Custody Law, 1660 to 1839. The origins of the judicial intervention, and this is uh, very key. This is where a lot of your family courts actually come from. Origins of judicial intervention in paternal custody. Paternal custody means father's rights, right? Many legal historians pre-1839 English child custody law is consisting of a near absolute paternal rights. These historians believe that the weakening of father's rights began with the 1839 Custody of Infants Act, which created uh, created certain maternal custody rights. Okay, you didn't get maternal custody rights to the 1839 Custody of Infants Act. Other historians have noted that the paternal custody was qualified even before 1839 by the Court of Chancery's application of the doctrine. Parents patriae. The note tells a different story that argues with the origin of the incursion into the so-called Empire of the Father was a 1660 Ten Years Abolition Act, a statute that ironically seemed to strengthen the father's rights. The Ten Years Abolition Act granted fathers the right to appoint guardians to their children by will. According to Blackstone, the effect of the act was to extend the father's empire even after his death. I said the legal the legal power of the father for a mother as such is entitled, but no power, but only reverence and respect. The power of the father, I say, over the persons of his children ceases at the age of twenty one, for the, for they are then enfranchised by arriving at years of discretion, or that point which the law has established 
as some must necessarily be established when the empire of the father or, or the guardian gives place to the empire of reason. Yet till the age arrives, the empire of the father continues even after his death, for he may by his will appoint a guardian to his children. In other words, the father's right was absolute. Skipping down, as this note will recount, some scholars have, like Blackstone, seen paternal rights as absolute under English law until the passage of the 1839 statute that created certain maternal custody rights. Once the father has granted a means of extending his power through legal instrument, judicial uh, inter interpretation, discretion seeped into his empire. And once judicial discretion entered even through initially in the guise of strengthening paternal rights, the empire of child custody was no longer the father's but that of the judge. In other words, control of the state. Pat patriarchy is a legal framework. By common law, it's a legal framework. Women have no rights in a patriarchy. Women have no custody rights in a patriarchy. In documents... It documents in short that the empire of the father fell and that its fall originated not with the 1839 statute meant to weaken paternal rights, but the 1660 statute that meant to strengthen them. The first mode of discussing the pre-1839 history of English child custody law, the more prevalent one in recent years, has been to recount the history in order to provide background for a history of Amer in American family law. The second mode, popular until the 17, 1970s, has been to trace the history of Penance Patria, an ancient English doctrine that the king, as the father of the nation, has the power to act in protection of the nation's weak and powerless, namely infants, idiots, and lunatics. Today, both the United States and England, Penance Patria is used in a variety of contexts, from the protection of mentally ill to the law of juvenile courts in order to justify the state's power to intervene. Parents back to the eye is state's power or judge's power. And this is where, this is showing, this is where it, it initiates from. The, the first group only examines that one small subset of child custody cases. It is the cases they exclude that define the contours of English court's power to control paternal custody. They're talking about the uh, the court of the chancery in this jurisdiction. Both Grossberg and Mason argue that under the system of English law inherited by the colonies and followed by American courts well into the 1800s, the father had absolute right to the custody of his children. That's patriarchy. Patriarchy is not just fatherhood, okay? It's a structure. It's it's a uh, it's American and English jurisprudence, and it's still alive today. Parents, uh, parent patria is still alive today. This this uh, common law uh, English precedent that started back in the 1600s is still alive today. the The 1839 um, Custody of Infants Act. Is still alive today. In fact, it's in Islamic law. Go back and read Islamic uh, today's Islamic law. It reads exactly like the Custody of Infants Act. Under this analysis, the American courts acted throughout the 19th century to replace British the British system of paternal rights with a judicial discretion that focused on maternal rights and the best in, best interest of the child. Maternal rights and best interest of the child didn't start until what? The 1839 Custody of Infants Act. Gross work, for example, states that the English Court of Chancery beginning in the 17th century developed a doctrine called Parents Patriae, which allowed it to interfere in paternal rights, but that no, does not cite any instance of the English application of this doctrine. He goes on to assert that the development of Parents Patriae into the, a means of challenging paternal rights, custody rights, went on more rapidly and fully in North America. They do, In other words, it diverged faster. A father's custody power evolved from a property right to trust to a trust tied to his responsibility as guardian. 
a fatherhood is a trust as an American innovation, one that he enlists in support of his thesis. Yet another example of anti-patriarchal ethos embedded, anti-patriarchal ethos embedded in Republican family law. So in other words, the, the Custody of Infants Act, um, the, the uh, Tender Years Doctrine, and all that stuff that we got in American law is anti-patriarchal. According to law, it's anti-patriarchal. Patriarchy is not fatherhood. Patriarchy is child custody, okay? Property held in trust by the father. Women have no rights in a in a, in a patriarchy. In a certain in, in a patriarchy, uh, women have little to no rights. I'm going to get into further in Caroline Norton's um, the rights of women because if you start reading this stuff, man, uh, even though she she's a proto feminist, right? All the stuff she outlines in women's law, in, in English women's law, is exactly feminism. It was enacted, but thing is, it didn't get developed until uh, until the eighteen well, really the eighteen fifty six and 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 forward, right? All that stuff came out of this, but it's anti patriarchal. And parents patriarchy that was developed in English law gives the court the right to intervene, the 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 court the right to take away custody away from the father. The Ten Years Doctrine and all the other. Uh, uh, mother's rights, as we say, is really paternal rights that the court is taking away from the father. The father has rights, and they have to be taken away from him. The thing is, what the what they're doing now is a mixed bag. Okay, they're using patriarchal law to tie you to the child and make you responsible for the child, but they're taking away custody of the child away from you because it's, because Penance patriarchy gives the judge discretion on who gets custody of the child, but that doesn't take away your 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 so-called patriarchal responsibility, which is bullshit. In other words, the patriarchy has been eroded to such a point that it doesn't exist anymore. That's what me and Gigi are trying to argue. You can call it patriarchal in name, you can call it patriarchal in custom, but real patriarchy does not exist in America or in the West. Period anymore. Often, third parties without uh, legal rights to custody of the child, usually mothers, would bring a writ of habeas corpus asking for the child to be delivered into their custody. In these cases, the court refused to order the child removed from the guardian with the legal right to custody on the grounds that it could not interfere with that legal right. A mother had to bring a claim. She had no rights. She had to prove that the court needed to remove the paternal rights and transfer it to her. So in other words, they would bring the kid into court, see if the kid was was abused or not sound or something was actually wrong in the kid's life, and then the court would have to take custody away from the father and give it to the mother. In other words, the, the, the court is the, the king's court, which is the uh, uh, father of the nation, quote unquote, the state has become father, father of the nation, and has replaced the father and is allowed to give custody or guardianship to who they see fit. That's like when you see on forums, parent or guardian. In this arena, the state has all the rights. You have no rights to your children. The state assigns rights to you. Legally, the, the blood parents have a the first claim of custody. But ultimate custody is not yours. The ultimate custody of the children is the state. According to parents, patriae. Anyway, there's one I wanted to read because it, it talks about, if I can skip down and find it. Oh, here's one. <clears throat> you can read this one. Maternal rights advocacy and the myth of absolute paternal rights. The crystallization into accept the truth of Blackstone's notion that English fathers had absolute rights to the custody of their children began in the 19th century England with the advent of agitation for maternal rights. Marital dissolution became increasingly common in, at the beginning of the 19th century. That is the Industrial Revolution. More and more cases emerged in which mothers competed with fathers for the custody of their children. That's how come it became popular for the courts to decide this. First, 
and the jurisprudence, jurisprudence itself, which repeatedly rejected maternal rights as a sufficient basis for the removal of children from their fathers, and second, in the treatment of these cases in the influ influential writings of Caroline Norton, whose crusade for the creation of maternal custody rights resulted in the 1839 uh, Custody of Infants Act. The a, a lack of maternal rights before 1839. Do you hear me? Amiri. Do you hear me? You don't read, you don't study, all you got is bullshit, okay? Prior to 1804, the Court of Chancery regularly granted mothers requests to restrain fathers from interfering with the custody of their children. The basis of these decisions was never that the mother had a right to the custody of her child, superseding the right of the father, but rather that the father had lost his own rights to custody, holding that the paternal custody rights are superior to maternal ones, but they never denied the superiority of judicial power to that of the fathers. In other words, a fa even even today, a father's claim is supposed to be superior to the mother's. In fact, I heard this has got to be twenty years ago. I heard a guy in one uh, one of these sovereign citizen um, uh, meetings where he actually said that he used this in court against his wife to get custody of his children. Yes, she used this. Most people don't know this. Even even on a, under parents patria, which is which gives the uh, the court ultimately uh, uh, rights to the child and, and to, to actually uh, demand not demand custody but assign custody. Even this, if you know this, parents patria always said that the father's claim was superior to the mother's claim. But this is what I wanted to point out. This is a ten years doctrine, and this comes from. Um, De Manville, the case of De Manville, I do believe this is in the 18th century. The absence of maternal custody rights was famously articulated by Blackstone in 1765. A mother, as such, is entitled to no power but only to reverence and respect. Even in Blackstone's time, however, the weakness of maternal rights was less extreme than the famous uh, quote implies. Most legal scholars of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, Blackstone included, agreed that the mother had had the right to her child when no other guardian existed to supersede her. It was only relative to other guardians, including the father and the father's appointed guardian. The mother had no enforceable custody rights. In Demandville, a mother petitioning for the custody of her infant daughter advanced the argument that children of such a tender age, a tender age doctrine is coming out of Demand, uh, Demandville, cannot without great danger be separated from her from the mother. The Lord Chancellor hearing demand will refuse to even consider the theory that children belong with their mothers. I do not mean to decide whether I am at liberty to pay attention to the affidavit of the wife, preferring instead to proceed as if the mother's argument did not exist. The court will do what is to, to the benefit of the infant without regard to the prayer. That's also where the best interest of the child comes from. So Demandville, the Demandville Court of 1765 is where the, the Tender Years Doctrine actually started in 1765. That was the plea. That is the court case. That came up with the Tender Years Doctrine is also the court case that the Demandville that Caroline Norton used in her pamphlet to actually get the Custody of Infants Act. But prior to that, Patriarchy is not fatherhood, okay? Patriarchy is the custody of the child, the paternal rights, the the right of the father to assign guardianship to the to, to all of his children because he's entrusted by God to do that. And that has for three for three thousand years, European patriarchy dealt with it this way. All going back to the Greeks and the Romans, the the uh, the uh, the patriarchy uh, ruled the father's empire, uh, ruled by father, had been this been the norm until it started being eroded in English law, and basically until the the custody of infant act infant infants acts in eighteen thirty nine, giving the court the right to 
assigned custody to the mother, giving them giving a maternal rights to the mother to the women didn't exist. Patriarchy is not just fatherhood, okay? Patriarchy is a structure, a, a legal cultural structure that had been around for 3,000 years in Europe. The rights of the father are superior. And it, the rights of the father being superior didn't get didn't get abolished until the custody of infant acts, infant acts in 1839, which the United States adopted. And the Americans actually fast forwarded because in 1896, it wasn't just the first seven years and the 10 years, it got forwarded to absolute custody uh, of mother's rights in uh, uh, 1896 actually boosting it up to 16. This is old English law that's been around for damn near 400 years and nobody talks about it because the women don't want to talk about it because if that is the case and all this stuff like the father's rights being superior, the father's claim being superior and the state interference in, in, in parents' rights or, 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 or people's rights to their children would get exposed. They don't want to expose that. Family court has a precedence is in the court of the chancery. Feminism comes out of this, out of Caroline Norton, the court of the chancery is a mother's rights. Mothers claim to their children. That's where feminism comes in. That's where female rights come in. And this is the whole kit and caboodle about English law and Western law doing this. It started with English law. It's called, it started with Caroline Norton. And it's got adopted. It's even in, the, in Islamic law now. Islamic law, which is still a semi-patriarchy, is getting eroded as we speak with this kind of doctrine. This is this is what the old patriarchy was, and this is what the so the quasi-patriarchy that we claim that we live in, that we don't, is today. Read them and weep. All that other bullshit that you hear about what a patriarchy is, and it is bullshit, does not apply. This, this is, the lawyers know this, okay? The lawyers know this. The law lawyers at the top, they know this. But the thing is, they keep the fuck, they, they shut the fucking mouths because they don't want to go up against the state. Anyhow, I think this has gone on long enough. Uh, it, hell, there's more. Trust and believe there's more because I'm trying to get through uh, Caroline Norton's pamphlets. And um, I want to read her, her pamphlets and I want to read um, her pamphlet on uh, on women's rights, the right of mothers. But that'll come later. That's a deeper dive. I haven't really got into this one that much. I'm uh, hopefully if, if I don't get with with the uh, GG Green Gorilla to actually do something on this, I actually will uh, do a further investigation of uh, this document because this is key. This is key. I don't know why uh, this is not known, and this has been around since 1999. But this this go this goes to the heart of uh, child custody and family courts. But with that, I'm going to jump off here. This is BGSI, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Peace.